Welcome to the JB Font channel. I am your host, James Fontleroy. So good to see all of you here on this Tuesday afternoon. The JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms. So go ahead and subscribe there. Also part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network. So you can see me there on Sundays and Thursdays. If you have not already, you guys can go ahead and subscribe to the Substack at jbfont.substack.com that alerts you to any email notification wherever I go live, upload clips, or write any articles so you have that there. Also, if you have not already, go ahead and give the stream a like that pushes me out into the algorithm. So I just want to thank all of you for that there. And in addition to and furthermore, welcome. Yes, this is not my usual time at 2 p.m. I'm doing this at 4. I'm just trying to see something. So we're going to get into the show today. By the way, if you have not already, go ahead and say hello into the chat. We're going to get into that and say hello to the chat. Before I start saying hello into the chat, I don't know. It's four o'clock, right? And I don't know. It, it's happy hour somewhere. And I don't know why. I just had a feeling. You know, it's happy hour somewhere. Why not? You know what I'm saying? It's four o'clock. Some people are having dinner right now. Some people are doing some other things on this other side of the world right now. You know what I'm saying? But why not? You know? So. Hey. Oh, that's sweet. Mm -mm -mm. That's carbs. That's curbs. Anywho, let's get into the chat and say hello to everyone. Let's get into, man, that's going to mess me up. That's too sweet. That's, that is going to mess me up. Anyway, let's say hello to everybody that's in the chat. All right. Who we got up in here? We have Extra Bulia coming in saying, live long and prosper. Good. Uh, is it live long and prosper? Yeah, live long and prosper. We have Miguel H coming in saying, peace. Good to see you in here. Jacqueline, Jack H, Jack. Hemmings, whichever. Look, Miss Hemmings, if you're nasty, good to see you in the chat as well. We got Helpful Harm coming in saying, excited for the stream. Always great analysis. Thank you so very much, Helpful Harm. It is nice to have you here as well. We have Wadi coming in saying, hey, everybody, good to see you in the chat as well. Wadi, nice to have you in. We have Samuel coming in saying, hey, JB, getting hit, drank on. <laughs> yep. Might as well, right? So it's good to see all of you here that is watching right now. Those of you who are watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Rockfin, Rumble, let's get this party started. So what are we going to be talking about today? Oh, that didn't even show up. Upload is taking too long. What do you mean upload is taking too long? What the hell are you talking about? Let's get it. Let's get this thing on right now. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about our primary story is going to be Apple in trouble. That's going to be a very interesting conversation to have because I think that I, I feel like I'm a little behind on this story, but I just want to put my two cents in. Um, and we're going to talk about this because uh, one of the biggest companies, corporations in the world is now in trouble with the U.S. government, which I'm like, is that is that actually going to result in anything or not? Go ahead and take the poll because I, I'm curious about your thoughts as well. But our first story is going to be racism in healthcare. Why is there a black man on dialysis like myself on there? In 2007, I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, ESRD, also known as chronic kidney failure, as a result of me being diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome at the age of nine. So it progressed to ESRD by the time I was 23. I know I look good, right? So with that being said, I had got on dialysis, and one of the things that was pushed, which I am grateful for, 
by my dialysis center, which is a nonprofit dialysis center, thank you very much, was transplant. Transplant, transplant, transplant. They said, James, we want you to get a transplant as soon as possible. Yes, a transplant is a treatment, not a cure, but it will improve your quality of life. So that was pushed my way. I got in my own way when it came to getting a transplant, right? And it's no fault of the, the, the dialysis center. They, you know, were basically like, okay, whatever you feel like doing, whatever you want to do, cool. We're behind you 100% as long as you take care of your health, right? Okay. So I decided to hold off on getting a transplant. And 16 years later, I am now starting that journey, right? Because I realized I was in my own way. I'm exhausted. I don't want to do trans. I, don't, I mean, sorry. I don't want to do a dialysis anymore. I would like to just live my life to the best of my ability. And that comes with the addition of me wanting to do more on the ground, me wanting to do more activism, me wanting to leave the world better than I found it, right? I can't do it while sitting on dialysis three days a week. I can't do it as well, I should say. I can do it, but not as I would like to, right? So there was an article that came my way. And I would like to give a shout out to Leroy. Leroy, you're the one that inspired this story. And it kind of smacked me in the face. But before I get into the article, I want to talk about something that a lot of people will probably kind of twist their nose or scrunch their nose at me for. And that is racism. On the left, there's a lot of people that say we can't focus on race. We have to only focus on class. Number one, class is also an identity. But also, race is a tool used by class to make a hierarchy. With that being said, that hierarchy is enforced in order to keep people disadvantaged more than others. This is also done within healthcare. Class and race are intertwined. When you have the class reductionist and the race reductionist both going, well, class is more important or race is more important. It's like, mm -mm, not within the context of this imperial core. No, they are both. It's not one over the, over the other because the system created it to be intertwined. So therefore, that's the way it is in this country. Unfortunately, you have to focus on both. So this is one of the things that we're gonna talk about is how race is intertwined into the medical system but also how it affects us as far as class analysis. So I'm just gonna share how race is affected within the medical system. Just going to look at a couple of videos that actually talk about it. And then we'll get into the article that I found that smacked me in my face. So let's get into this. All right. Let me share the screen. And I know there's going to be some people that may disagree, and that's okay. But ultimately, It all boils down to race and class, all right? So let's take a look at this. 
So this is how systemic racism actually affects medicine. A 2016 study looked at the perceptions that medical students and doctors had when it came to African-American patients. What the study found was that there were medical students and doctors who believed that African-Americans had a higher pain tolerance than any other race, which is actually not true. This was a false belief that many people had. You see, you cannot quantify pain and you can't compare pain tolerance between certain races just because it is impossible to do that. We all perceive pain differently and we all have a different tolerance for pain irregardless of what our race is or what the color of our skin is. But by believing that there are biological differences, many people, even doctors, believe that African Americans are able to tolerate more pain and thus African Americans often do not get the care they deserve and they need which is wrong. Now, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that could this be exclusively a class issue? Yeah. But a lot of times it's race. Now, uh, you guys can go back to when I brought up the article about how NYU was discriminating against poor patients and they were sending them to the more, uh, into the hospital that has a further influx of patients in it. They would just dump those patients onto that hospital and then you know, the patients that were giving money, donating money to NYU, those patients, whenever they came into the emergency room or the emergency department, they were put to the top of the list in triage. Instead of it being actual based on medical evidence and care, it's based on your tax bracket, right? So that's a class based. But it goes further because you could still be poor and white, but you still get better treat better treatment in the medical field. So this is where race comes in. Never mind the fact that there have been rich black folk who even reported to being discriminated against based on their race as well. Never mind the fact that there has been reports of infant mortality among black mothers. I can, I can literally just pull these up, but what's the use, right? Because we all know that these figures. But it's true. And so I think this is why it is important to focus on both not one or the other, not to separate both because we are affected disproportionately because of it. We're affected really in both ways. So I have another video that I would like to share. Let me share this as well. Okay. I should have had these already up, but. Mm. All right. So, this is another variable that people don't think about if you don't have to constantly think about race. Hey, Doc, can you help me? My baby's losing weight. She's not eating, and she's developed all these bruises all over her body that I don't know where it's from. Oh, my gosh, the poor thing. Totally not your fault. Let's get you connected with a lactation consultant, a nutritionist, and let's just draw some labs to make sure baby is medically okay. Now, by the way, just to let you guys know, this is an exclusive to all white patients that get seen, but it's been done enough to the point where we notice. 
we notice how it happens. We notice how white patients are treated in comparison to black patients. We see it all the time. And even white patients will go, well, yeah, I was treated like this. Why weren't you? Oh my gosh, what have you been doing to this child? This is very neglectful. Why didn't you bring her in sooner? And I don't know about these bruises. They seem really suspicious. I'm gonna have to call CPS. I'm a mandated reporter. And people can say, well, this is just cherry pick, but if it happens so often, then why are we able to pinpoint this? And 99% of black people are able to go, yep, mm -hmm, that's how it happens. How? One more. There's a doctor, well, I think he's a medical student on TikTok. And he talks about the difference, not the differences, but how racism in medicine really affects us. And let me just share his page. So his name is uh, Joe Prevell. He has a TikTok page. And a lot of the testing, uh, a lot of things that are done with testing, it has to do with um, a lot of testing has to do with the fact that they actually tested on white patients more than they did with black patients. So therefore, like for instance, things like post ox post ox monitor ox monitors they are typically formulated for white skin than it is for darker colored skin tones. So when it comes to post ox monitors, you know, things like that, it's just like it it doesn't measure it as accurately as it should. There's also uh, measures and testing, even in our instruments, when it, it, it changes the values or changes the calculations for somebody black versus white. So this doctor here, I call him doctor, I think he's still a medical student, but he's doing, you know, some great work when it comes to uh, when it comes to basically talking about the disparities in in healthcare. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show one out of many. So let me see. I'll just do this one. Almost four years ago, in December 2020, I made this video about a racial disparity with a device called a pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeters look like this. They're devices that go on your finger and they measure what's called your blood oxygen saturation level. The studies like this one have shown that pulse oximeters are three times as likely to show inaccurate, overestimated oxygen saturation levels in patients with darker skin tones. What's crazy is for decades, scientists have published studies in journals like this one about how pulse oximeters don't work equally in darker skin tones. In fact, this article, which says that skin pigmentation and other absorbers impact measurement of pulse oximeters, is from 1976. Yet even now, years after I made my video, the problem still hasn't been fixed and conversations are still ongoing. So here's some updates about what's happened since. First, in 2021, the FDA finally issued a warning about the limitations of pulse oximeters, how they may not read equally in darker skin tones. In 2022, an FDA panel met to review the clinical data about the accuracy of pulse oximeters. Studies from that year found that the overestimation of oxygen levels led to Black patients receiving delayed care when it came to COVID-19. 
And just last month, in February 2024, the FDA panel met again to evaluate the accuracy and performance of pulse oximeters in patients with darker skin. I'm honestly not surprised how long it's taking to fix this problem. The reason this disparity exists is because it's based on data and research that has historically excluded people of color. So much of medicine is built off of white, able-bodied male perspectives. And that's why it's so important to understand the biases that exist in technology, how that gets passed down to patients, and how that gets perpetuated in a system. Almost four years ago, in December 2020, I made this video about a racial disparity with a device called a pulse. So basically, that's based on, you know, the research is always done on male, white, cisgender, right, typically. And so when it comes to a lot of the racial disparities, it's based on prior research that was based on racist assumptions that happens within us. So with that being said, it happens um, quite a bit, but I just want to share this with you guys. So this is the article that I would like for you guys to see. And shout out to Leroy for this article. So, let me make sure this is large enough. And yes, you are reading this correct. It says, a biased test kept thousands of Black people from getting a kidney transplant. It's finally changing. I just want to stop you there before I get into the article. Because as somebody that's trying to get a kidney transplant now, I want you guys to think about if I had tried for a kidney transplant years ago, keep that in your brain. Let's go. says, Jasmine Evans has been waiting for a new kidney for four years when her hospital revealed shocking news. She should have been put on a transplant list in 2015 instead of 2019. And a racially biased organ test was to blame. And upsetting as that notification was, it was also part of an unprecedented move to mitigate the racial inequity. Evans is among more than 14,000 Black kidney transplant candidates so far given credit for lost waiting time, moving them up the priority list for their transplant. Yes, there are Black patients that should have been transplanted a long time ago, but because of this test, they did not get the transplant in the time that they should have gotten it. Is that a class issue or is that a race issue? Let's continue. It says, she says, I remember just reading that letter over and over again. She said, how could this happen? says at issue is a once widely used test that overestimated how well black people's kidneys were functioning, making them look healthier than they really were, all because of an automated formula that calculates results for black and non-black patients differently. That race-based equation could delay diagnosis of organ failure and evaluation for a transplant, exacerbating other disparities that already make black patients more at risk for needing a new kidney, but less likely to get one. Since a few years ago, the National Kidney Foundation and American Society of Nephrology prodded laboratories to switch to a race-free equations in calculating kidney function. Then the U.S. Organ Transplant Network ordered hospitals to use only race-neutral tests, resulting in adding new patients to the kidney waiting list. Quote, the immediate question came up. What about the people on the list right now? You can't just leave them behind, end quote, said Dr. Martha 
uh, Pavlakis of Boston's Beth Israel Dikanes Medical Center and former chair of the Network Kidney Committee. Pavlakis called what happened next an attempt at restorative justice. The transplant network gave hospitals a year to uncover which black kidney candidates could have qualified for a new kidney sooner if not for the race-based test and adjust their waiting time to make up for it. That look back continues for each newly listed black patient to see if they too should have been referred sooner. So when people come to me and talk about, oh, well, we shouldn't be looking for, you know, to give black people reparations because their, you know, ancestors were the ones that were wrong. Look at what's going on with black people today. Look at what's going on with us, even when it comes to in regards to kidney transplants. There's a lot of us that should have gotten a transplant a while back, but we never did. And now because equity is being introduced, I know some people don't like that word. Now we're getting being bumped up to the list because it's the just and right thing to do. Are white people who are patients on that list going to get mad because they were up on the list before some of these black people were based on a racist system and testing that put them behind? Or are you going to say, you know what, that was wrong of what was happening to them. And so I'm glad now that they're actually going to get put on the right spot on the list even though I was originally ahead of them, that wasn't the right spot. They actually needed it before I did. Let's continue. Between January, 2023 and mid-March, mid -March, more than 14,300 black kidney transplant candidates have had their wait times modified by an average of two years, according to the United Network of Organ Sharing, which runs the transplant system. So far, more than 2,800 of them, including Evans, have received the transplant. But it's just one example of a larger problem permeating healthcare. Numerous formulas or algorithms used in medical decisions, treatment guidelines, diagnostic tests, risk calculators adjust the answers according to race or ethnicity in a way that puts people of color at a disadvantage. We are literally, as Black people, treated worse in the healthcare system because of the color of our skin. So it is also based on healthcare that we are treated. And it's, and it's factored into the machines. Given how embedded these equations are in medical software and electronic records, even doctors may not realize how widely they impact care decisions. Health equity scholars have been raising alarm bells about the way race has been misused in clinical algorithms for decades. That's from Dr. Michelle Morse, from New York City's chief medical officer. Change is beginning slowly, no matter, I'm sorry, no longer are obstetricians opposed to include race in determining the risk of a pregnant woman attempting vaginal birth after a prior C-section. The American Heart Association just removed race from a commonly used calculator of people's heart disease risk. The American Thoracic Society has urged replacing race-based lung function evaluation. The interesting part, especially about that, especially about race-based lung function, I can't tell you 
how many black people may have end up having asthma, but we're told we don't have it. Or how many of us black people are in pain, but we're told it's not as bad as if we were, unless we were white. How many black women have complained of pain and they should have been diagnosed with endometriosis, but because the OBGYN just said, ah, they're black. They have a higher tolerance for pain. It's just strong cramps. When in reality, they actually had a condition that needed to be treated. This happens all the time, all the time. And how are black people treated within the medical system? A lot like, a lot like the way we're treated in the criminal justice system, we're not believed. Let's continue. It says the kidney saga is unique because of the effort to remedy a past wrong. Quote, lots of time when we see you, you see health inequities, we just assume there's nothing we can do about it. We can make changes to restore faith in the health system and actually address the unfair and unavoidable outcomes that Black people and other people of color face, end quote. Black Americans are over three times more likely than white people to experience kidney failure. I'm going to read this again. Black Americans are over three times more likely than white people to experience kidney failure. Of the roughly 89,000 people currently on the waiting list for a new kidney, about 30% are black. I want you guys to go in your mind and go back to the statistic. How many people in the United States are black of African descent? How many of us? That's right, 13%. 13%. And yet 30% of us are experiencing kidney failure. Why is that? Care to think about it? Anyone? Let's continue. It says race isn't a biological factor like age, sex, or weight. I'm going to repeat that again. Race isn't a biological factor like age, sex, or weight. It is a social construct. I would add to this, it's not just a social construct. It is also a colonial construct. It says, so how does this make its way into calculations of kidney function? Now, let's get into the science. It says the EGFR, or estimated gromular filtration rate, evaluates kidney health based on how quickly a waste compound called creatinine gets filtered from blood. It says in 1999, an equation used to calculate EGFR was modified to adjust Black people's results compared to everyone else. Remember what I said when I ended up on dialysis. I ended up on dialysis in 2007. This is after 1999. Meaning, when they calculated my GFR, guess what, chicken butt? That means that mine was calculated according to my skin color. Which means that I was calculated according to a race-based system. Let's continue. Until recently, that meant many lab reports would list two results, one calculated for Black patients and another for Black patients, I'm sorry, for non-Black patients and another for Black patients that could overestimate kidney function by as much as 16%. Now, I'm going to share this with y'all, all right? Because I have, hang on, let me enlarge myself. All right. So I have my labs from last month right here, right? Now, 
it measures the creatinine levels. Now, my creatinine, let me see. So, the typical range for a person on dialysis is males, 18 to 14, and then females, 6 to 12. So, 8 to 14 and females, females 6 to 12. Creatinine is made by the body and depends on how muscular and or active a person is. Creatinine is removed by the kidneys in dialysis. Creatinine is an indicator of how well you are dialyzed and your kidney function. So, if your creatinine is high, that means that your body isn't filtering out as much according to the GFR or the EGFR as it should, right? So I'll just share this here. So hang on, let me put that down. All right. So if you guys can see creatinine, right? Right there, right? Eight to 14, right? And I'm right at the edge, right? Which means that my dialysis cleaning is not as sufficient as it should be. It should be better. But with that being said, As far as this is concerned, it's probably updated now to not factor in my race. But back in the, the day, oh, my race was factored in. Which means that my condition was seen as slightly better than what it actually was. So when it comes to people talking about like what's going on in far as far as health disparities and things like that it's even factored into how we measure things and and, and testing all right so let's go back it says not every black candy candidate was affected some may have had kidney failure diagnosed without a test others to have a chance at benefiting from UNOS, uh, UNOS mandated look back, transplant center staff turned detectives often worked at, after hours and weekends hunting years old records for a test that recalculated without race adjustment might make the difference. So Let's go here. It says, how long does it take a kidney transplant? Depend how long it takes to get a kidney transplant depends on the patient's blood type, medical urgency, and a mix of other factors, including how long they've been on the waiting list. Evans first listed in April 2019 when Jefferson Transplant Center unearthed her old tests. They found she should have qualified in September 2015. So it says, just for context, when I was still an undergrad, I could have been on the list. She said what she called mind-blowing credit of three and a half more years waiting also provided a glimmer of hope that she'd be offered a matching kidney soon. So she was three and a half years behind based on a race-based test. So I think it's important when we talk about how we're treated within the medical field that people, especially those of you who are in the medical field, it puts us at a disadvantage each and every time. Why do I get? Why do I feel relieved whenever I have a black tech, a black nurse, or a black doctor? Why do I feel relieved? That's not to say that just because they're black doesn't mean that they still won't go by some of the racial biases that are taught to many medical students. It's not to say that, is that a lot of times that people of color, especially black people who are techs, nurses, doctors, 
specialists, a lot of times they will say, hmm, that's BS. I'm going to test for this anyway, despite what I was taught. Like, for instance, oh, I have a female here that's complaining of unusually strong uh, pain, especially during menstruation. Let me test to see if she have, might have endometriosis. I'm not going to take what her pain, she says, and then just say, you know what? No, because Black people typically have a higher pain tolerance. No, that to me is BS. Or if somebody is black that's complaining about pain when they come into the hospital, I'm not going to give them a, I'm not going to give them a less regard when they said they have pain, especially if they're like on a pain scale on from one to 10, how much are you hurting? And if they're telling me eight, nine, you know, or 10, then I'm going to give them less regard than a white person who says eight, nine or 10. Just because I can't see the red in our faces doesn't mean we're not hurting that much. Okay? Just because we're darker skin and you can't see us blushing or you can't see our face turning red as red doesn't mean that we're not feeling the way we feel. Let me share something with you guys too. This is from the National Center for Biotechnology Information. This is a part of the NIH. It says racial disparities in medical care should be understood within the context of racial inequities in societal institutions. Systematic discrimination is not the aberrant behavior, but of a few, but often supported by institutional policies and unconscious bias based on negative stereotypes. Effectively addressing disparities in the quality of care requires improved data systems, increased regulatory vigilance, a new initiative to appropriately train medical professionals and recruit more providers from disadvantaged minority backgrounds. Now, let me ask you something. To the people who hate DEI, huh, this part says, recruit more providers from disadvantaged minority backgrounds. How would that help? What did I say earlier? To combat some of the disparities that is within our systems, our medical systems already, to combat that, you need some people that have our experience in order to know. For instance, there was a video of a, ah, oh, I wish I had found it, but there was a video of a black nurse that said that a white nurse wanted to do a, I think she was a, a nurse in, in the, the labor and delivery unit. And she, the white nurse wanted to have a psychological consult on the patient because she said she kept hitting her head. She said, everything's fine, but she just keeps hitting her, hit her, hitting her head. Black people. A black woman hitting herself on the head? What is that? Black woman doing this. What is that? Is that need for a, a psych consult? Is this a need for a psych consult? No. Why? Because a black nurse recognized that she probably had a weave or so in and her head was itching. So the only way to scratch it is to pat it. But because the white nurse doesn't know anything about that, guess what? She wanted to get the black woman a psych eval. She wanted to waste the psych doctor's time on a patient that didn't need it and then potentially get 
a psych doctor to make her think that she was crazy by hitting herself in the head when really she was just itching. So when people talk about, oh, well, DEI, look, by the way, it's not our fault that it exists. Get rid of these disparities, then, hey, we won't need it. So it says, identifying and implementing effective strategies to eliminate racial inequalities in health status and medical care should be made a national priority. Since national data revealed that over the past 50 years, the health of both black and white persons has improved in the United States, as evidenced by increases of life expectancy and declines of infant and adult mortality. However, black persons continue to have higher rates of morbidity and mortality than white persons for most indicators of physical health. Hispanics and, Indian, and American Indians also have elevated disease and death rates for multiple conditions. Although the role of medical care as a determinant of health is somewhat limited, medical care, especially preventative care, early intervention, and the appropriate management of chronic disease can play an important role in health. Thus, racial and ethnic differentials in the, in to, in the quantity and quality of care are a likely contributor of racial disparities in health status. Compared with white persons, black persons, and other minorities have lower levels of access to medical care in the United States due to higher rates of unemployment and underrepresentation in good paying jobs that also include health insurance as part of a benefit package. So, guess what? Here's the question Is it race? Is it class? Or is it both? I'll wait. Race and class or race and identity are intertwined within this country. It is not something that we can get away from without Improving the equity between people who have been disadvantaged for, I'd say, the last four to 500 years. I think that's important. It says more striking and disconcerting to many is the large and growing number of studies that find racial differences and the receipt of major therapeutic procedures for a broad range of conditions, even after adjustment for insurance status and severity of disease. So even when you account for adjustments for insurance status and severity of disease, there's still differences. There's still differences in the receipt of ma major therapeutic procedures. It says especially surprising are many of the racial disparities in context where differences in economic status and insurance coverage are minimized, such as the Veterans Health Administration, the VA, and the Medicare program. Other research indicates that Although physicians' ability to detect the severity of pain does not differ for Hispanic versus non-Hispanic white patients, Hispanic patients are markedly less likely than non-Hispanic white patients to receive adequate analgesia. Recent studies document that these differences in their receipt of therapeutic procedures have adverse effects on health of minority groups. How do we make sense of these differences and how do we move forward with the effective policy and research agenda to eliminate these disparities? So when we talk about these things, it's not just, oh, you're a liberal because you're talking about race. Stop that. Stop it. because that is also an important subject to cover. 
and I'm gonna be honest with you. Real talk, and this is no offense to anybody watching. But this is why a lot of us black people on the left look at some people who are white on the left with a side eye. It needs to be looked at further. Like it's not just class only. And just just let you know, it's not race only either. So those of you who only want to talk about race and want to keep the capitalist system in place, <laughs> no, it is not. You also have to look at the class issue. It is both. And it's both been both for quite a while. It's been both ever since the inception of this nation. So I think this is something that needs to be discussed further, especially when it comes to how we are treated within the medical system. So, yeah. And uh, this is another reason why I think that we need to have a nationalized healthcare system, a nationalized healthcare system that also does an equitable revamping of our system so that it's like, okay, we have a nationalized healthcare system. Let's push for more people who are of marginalized communities into our healthcare system so that we can circumvent the disparities that have been put about in years prior. I think that's important because if we, let's say hypothetically, we introduce a nationalized healthcare system here in the United States, but what about the disparities that are there according to medical research from the past? Are we going to just continuously depend on that medical research from the past? Or are we going to redo and revamp and look again at some of these research results and some of these algorithms that have been put our way and say, hmm, these doctors were on the right track, but they shouldn't have counted race in this regard. So then it's not only a class issue, but it's also a race issue that we're also factoring into. So, with that being said, go ahead and give the stream a like. That pushes me out into the algorithm. Thank you so very much to everybody for that as well. So, let's go into... Let me go into... The chat. Who was I gonna go? Oh, Rockfin. All right. Looks like we're good on the Rockfin side. Let's go into the general chat. Yes. Leroy Beresford, yes. Shout out to him. As that's who I was referring to. Yes. Rando online says, I have lost faith in the healthcare system in the US over the years. They can and will kill people with this kind of thinking. Unfortunately, that's that's right. Okay, thank you so much, Roger. Okay, I'll give it a I'll make sure to do that. Um Grant says it's not just class and race, but also gender and sexuality. Yes, that's why I say um class and identity are intertwined. I try to make sure I, I say that, but if I miss that, then my apologies. 
Uh, Jacqueline says it makes people wary of taking their children to a hospital unless it's a life or death situation. Imagine something going on with your kid and you're black. Zoe uh, says my first pediatrician was a white woman that called CPS for my parents because I was underweight at four years old. I could rant all day about how medical averages are minority from white people. I was never. I was never neglected when I was when I compare how I was raised to white kids. It's a clear. It's clear a lot of my white peers had awful parents. I'm happy. My fam found out an Afro-Cuban pediatrician soon after. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Cobra Commander says, I never married, so my kid's last name is Sanchez. From then they got, from then they're going to face discrimination just from names on paperwork. The system is that racist. Yeah. B. Elite said, I feel like my mom not giving my father's, not I guess I think he meant giving me my father's name was probably a smart move. Mm. Yeah. Randall Online says, what pisses me off is this kind of thing could have been avoided if it wasn't for racist BS. Hmm. Roger says, you and Sergio are in the same position. I hope you let him know you're recovering this day. I forgot to let him know. I'm sorry. Yeah. But yes, I, I am covering this because people meet people like myself and Sergio are both in the same position. Let's continue. Kilia Grigor says, yeah, my close friend was able to get a heart and kidney transplant after COVID. Uh destroyed his heart and kidneys. He's Italian, but a gym rat, vegan, and 10K a day runner. So that probably got him on the top of the list. Yeah. Zoe says, race-based evaluations need to be considered medical malpractice on the grounds of discrimination. Mm. Zoe says, it took me five different evaluations for five different psychologists to receive my Asperger's diagnosis. Being a black person makes it so hard to get taken seriously for any medical or mental diagnosis. Sad. Can we talk about how uh, psych evaluations and mental evaluations are also affected, affecting us as black people? Can we talk about it? Because... Some of us may have different conditions. You know, it may be Asperger's. It could be autism. We could have, uh, it could be things like, oh, um, bipolar disorder. It could be so many different things. It could be, you know, real OCD that we may have. You never know. But the thing is, is that we're constantly being dismissed. Good to see you, CBC voter. Nice to have you in here as well. All right. Dwayne says, because white people have demonstrated a lack of concern for the lives of black people. I know I shouldn't have to say this, but when we say white people, we don't mean all. Unfortunately, there is a point where we still get dismissed, even sometimes on the left. And it's like, well, if you're talking about race, you're a liberal. And it's like, I'm literally a communist. I'm like, the Fred Hampton, Kwame Ture type communist. But me talking about race is apparently a liberal position. It's not.
but we get tagged that so many times and how many times we talked about being black and being on the left and enduring the system on revolutionary blackout network it's just a question it, it it you know why does rbn exist why do we feel a need to create an all black network from a black perspective why did we did we feel a need to do that because we're not being heard. And, and this is not a sexy, sexy subject. It's not. Look, I don't have that many people watching. Why? Because it's not a sexy subject, because I'm not going after somebody. But it's true. It's like what the great Michael Brooks, the late Michael Brooks said, be kind to people, be ruthless to systems and institutions. We have to be ruthless to these systems and institutions, including not just the capitalist system, but it's little brother racism and white supremacy. Jacqueline says, I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure that there is a certain amount of racism in the UK NHS. Maybe not the same extent, but it's there. And that's true. I'll accept that. It's probably true. But look, we have to focus on the equity when it comes to people in the medical field, too. Thank you very much, notary. Appreciate it. Wesley says it's kind of depressing. It is, but at the same time, this is why the system needs to change. This is why we talk about changing the system from the ground up so that we can make this a, a different system, one that actually benefits everybody no matter our immutable characteristics. And the thing is, it's like it's not meant to be depressing. It's meant to put a fire within us to push for changing things more. <laughs> All right. So let me go to this as well. While you're at it, I would also like to thank all the patrons on Patreon. Without you guys, I would not be able to do this work. You guys make this possible. You guys make this happen. So I just want to give a thanks to patrons on Patreon, as well as on Coffee, as well as anybody that sends me anything through PayPal. And yes, I am demonetized. So if you'd like to support the channel, you guys can support via Patreon or PayPal. Thank you so very much. Now, if you guys would like to, you guys can also become patrons on Patreon. Here are the tiers, and these are the breaks. Okay, here we go. All right, kids. So here's, you got JB members, Solidarity, Comrade, JB Fonters, Super JB Fonters, Super duper JB Fonters and Mega JB Fonters. There you have it. So thank you so very much. And just a shout out to all future patrons for joining as well. So thank you. So let's go to our primary story for today Apple in trouble. Listen, no boys don't mean to bust your bubble. But the corporations of the world are nothing but trouble. So the next time a corporation tries to give you the play, just remember my rhymes and get the hell away. <laughs> 
So, yes, there is this happening. Uh, let me share this with you guys because I was just like, what? What is going on with Apple? Apple apparently is being sued by the United States government. I'm kind of surprised. So we'll get into that in a second. But uh, this seems kind of like a bit of a fluff piece, but I think it's important to get some of this information as well. This is from More Perfect Union, and they have five Shakir. Yes, you you guys know, remember that name? Uh, he was a part of Justice Democrats back in the day. I guess he's working with More Perfect Union now. But, you know, never mind him. Let's talk about the information that this video provides, and we'll get into it right now. Some of the biggest companies in America hate what is going on in this building for reasons that most of the public are completely unaware of. I came here to the United States Department of Justice to talk about a specific 800 person unit that works in that building. It's called the Antitrust Division, headed by a man named Jonathan Cantor. If you look at the headlines about Jonathan Cantor's work, you will see on a daily basis, Wall Street is angry with Jonathan Cantor. They've never seen a regulator like this guy. They've never seen anyone like this. Angry with the antitrust enforcement actions that are going on in the Biden administration. I think if you're Google in particular, I, I would kind of be shaking in my boots. Why? Why do you think corporate America is so scared? I hate a guy who plays for free. That's a dangerous thing. So upset with what's going on here in this building behind me. We're going to talk about that. Are they shaking in their boots, though? I'm... We're talking about Biden's Justice Department. I'm not necessarily shaking in my boots because what did Joe Biden say originally? Uh, I'm a capitalist. They're not really shaking in their boots. At least not to me. Anywho, let's continue. One of the reasons I was most excited to talk to you, Jonathan, is because of your job, an interesting an exclusive perspective on America's economy. You look at a whole host of industries across the board. You think of shipping and rail, private equity, healthcare, banks, uh, ticket vendors, you know, all kinds of things that you uniquely have perspective on. Do you sense an economy that's getting more complicated for the regular person to navigate? Absolutely. We hear about it every day. We hear from consumers who are increasingly finding it impenetrable. Companies should be out there innovating to make things easier, not harder. Healthcare should be about delivering the best possible outcome to a patient, not about um, a faceless intermediary. The companies make it harder because they want to maximize profits. I, I mean, isn't that the goal of these corporations? Within the capitalist system, that's the goal of corporations. In fact, the CEOs have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize the profits for the shareholders, typically within a capitalist system. What is so different? Like, what? Here's my question Why are these two surprised that cappies are going to cap? It doesn't. Baby, let me tell you, this is. This is, oof, this is headache inducing. All right, let's continue. Increasingly, we're seeing these, you know, the rise of intermediaries, platforms, multi sided markets, things that um, sit between the person who makes something and the person who buys something, the person who offers a service and the person who consumes that service. One of the most important cases that Jonathan is bringing involves this company called Agristats. Agristats is one of these many middlemen in today's economy. They don't produce anything. They're a data warehouse. They find a price point, a price point that works for the profit maximization of the largest meat producers while keeping the farmers' take as low as possible. More money is being gobbled up by those intermediaries. If you look at a lot of, not all of them, but if you look at a lot of our cases, they're focused on those intermediaries and making sure that they are not becoming choke points in our economy, that they are not becoming facilitators of more money being sucked out of the middle and less going to the people who actually make and build, deliver things, and the people who buy and consume uh, and enjoy things. For many. 
so you can think of intermediaries as look. I look at health, uh, at private healthcare as an intermediary because they're literally making healthcare decisions for people instead of it being done by your doctor. They're determining how your health is, how, your health outcomes instead of your doctor doing it based on these insurance people who are working in the background that's saying, oh, well, uh, according to this paper, you don't need this when in reality, the doctor's saying, no, I, I need this test or I need this thing done because the doctor is actually seeing you, not the insurance company seeing you. The insurance company doesn't have your vitals. The insurance company does not have your test results. And even if they do, are they? do they actually have the medical expertise to tell what should and shouldn't be done? Are insurance companies really in the business of diagnosing and treating patients? No. So therefore, they should not be there in the first place. I'm going to be, look, as radical as y'all may think I am, I'm going to say this. Insurance companies, private insurance companies do not deserve to exist. No, they don't deserve to exist. I do not want somebody between me and my doctor. It should be my doctor and me making these decisions, not a health insurance. This is why I say we need a full nationalization of our health care system. There should not be health care companies anymore. In fact, if we were to have a nationalized health care system, we would not even need Medicare anymore because it's all being taken care of health wise in the system. There wouldn't be a need to pay anybody uh, through a insurance system. Insurance for what? But yes, there are many intermediaries. Many consumers or people are wondering why they're paying higher prices for X thing. It feels or seems just reading from your complaints about some of these issues that it is the role of data being uh, transacted by these middlemen that is playing an inordinate role. Is that fair? Absolutely. So um, the the asymmetry of power, the imbalance um, is made, is amplified by data and it will be continually amplified by uh, things like AI where machines can more perfectly and more um, and more quickly figure out how to charge you more or how to um, keep you from going to a competitor that charges less. I thought, wait, I thought that capitalism breeds innovation. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's innovation for the capitalists, not for you. See, that's the thing they leave out. They always leave out, oh, capitalism, it, it breeds innovation for the owners. It doesn't breed innovation for the consumer. It doesn't breed innovation for you. It just breeds innovation for to help them make more money and to squeeze you even more drier than you already are. Ah, do you get it now? Mm, 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 mm. How to extract more from you um, and avoid competition. Mm -hmm. This issue of algorithmic price fixing that Jonathan's talking about is critically important. One of his major lawsuits that he's brought involves this Texas-based company called RealPage. A ProPublica investigation of RealPage found that it is using software to inflate rents that people are paying all across America. Your housing prices are going up because of an algorithm that's telling landlords that they can get more money out of you. Oh, see, that's the innovation that we're talking about. The innovation to squeeze more money out of you. So then if you cannot pay it, then you wind up homeless. Markets that involve data are more likely to um, tip to one player uh, and result in more centralized choke point economy. That's a problem. One of the things I'm learning from you in this conversation is that the future of quote unquote price may be less static. That what we're seeing through algorithms and the transaction of data is if you walked up virtually to a cereal box now, that 
price is rotating and moving on you because I, it's gauging who you are, what your consumption habits are, how much money you might have to spend, and literally changing it on you. And those prices aren't just moving on the consumer, they're moving on everybody in the supply chain. I talk about how people used to con transact business. And it used to be people, uh, our cases in the antitrust world involved um, smoke-filled rooms where people would you know, shake hands and agree to fix prices. Well, the new theater for that kind of conduct is going to be giving information to um, a, uh, a robot, to AI, that steps in and does that same thing, but can do it faster, it can do it more precisely, uh, and it can do it in a way that's more insidious and nefarious. And so it's really important that we say, okay, just because it's a one and a zero, it's just because it's being done by a machine instead of a person, doesn't make it any less problematic. In some ways, it makes it worse. How much does the consideration of the laborer in today's economy factor into how you think about the cases that you bring. This is essential. There's one case that we're very proud of where we, it was a private case, but where we took an important role um, in arguing uh, for a precedent. And this was a woman, a hardworking woman at a McDonald's, and she wanted the opportunity to get a managerial position. She couldn't get it in her current establishment. So she uh, interviewed and got an offer to be a manager at a different franchise. And so this was the path where drop mobility, you go from being a fry cook to being a manager. Well, there was a non-compete agreement that said she couldn't take the job at the other fast food establishment, even though that job was not available where she currently worked. And she had the courage to sue. And we went to court and said, she is right. A non-compete agreement that keeps a hardworking woman from having the opportunity to earn more money, not by putting a handout, but earn more money by working harder by succeeding and getting an offer to be a manager, that's exactly what we should be protecting. Now, never mind the fact that you said not giving her a handout, but it's whatever. That just goes to show how the system itself is geared to pushing people into a, a space where they're Profits are the profits are maximized by squeezing people as much dry as they possibly can. So let me share this as well. So let's get into it. So this is Merrick Garland talking about suing Apple. So if I can get this. All right, let's go. It's going to be laying out this case against Apple. Uh, let's go to that. Line. Good morning. Earlier today, the Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, sued Apple in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey for violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Over the last two decades, Apple has become one of the most valuable public companies in the world. Today, its net income exceeds the individual gross domestic product of more than 100 countries. That is in large part due to the success of the iPhone, Apple's signature smartphone product. For over a decade, iPhone sales have made up a majority of Apple's annual revenue. Today, Apple's share of the US performance smartphone market exceeds 70%, and its share of the entire US smartphone market exceeds 65%. Apple charges as much as nearly $1,600 for an iPhone. But as our complaint alleges, Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. First of all, Y'all paying $1,600 for a phone? All right. Look, $150. This is, I got this, what, three, four years ago? 
at least. And that was because I absolutely needed it, not because I just wanted to upgrade. $150. You got people paying 10 times that just for an iPhone? How much you want to bet I could do just as much as all the stuff I can do on this phone with it than you can do with an iPhone? <sighs> Boy, I'm telling you. Man, they're really trying to squeeze people dry based on vibes? It's crazy. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. For developers, that has meant being forced to play by rules that insulate Apple from competition. And as outlined in our complaint, we allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. That is what capitalism does. It's never about making things better for the consumer. It's about making things better for the shareholders. Apple will continuously make things worse. I cannot tell you how many Apple users I have encountered where they say that they try to avoid the iOS updates as much as possible because their phone always works worse after an update. How many of you have Apple phones in the chat? How many of you have experience and update and then your phone starts working worse afterwards? Go ahead. Let me know. Sean Miller says iPhone costs about a dollar thirty six. No, no, it's not a dollar thirty six to make. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me it's a dollar thirty six to make. You mean to tell me that they are upcharging people by over a thousand percent? No, that can't be. That's crazy. Oh my God. Oh my stars and stripes. You said in parts, not labor. Okay, yeah, but still. You mean to tell me that with parts and labor, an iPhone could probably cost about $30 to make? Mm -mm -mm. Why well, I ain't got no iPhone now? Apple carries out its exclusionary anti-competitive conduct in two principal ways. First, Apple imposes contractual restrictions and fees that limit the features and functionality that developers can offer iPhone users. Second, Apple selectively restricts access to the points of connection between third-party apps and the iPhone's operating system, degrading the functionality of non-Apple apps and accessories. As a result, for most of the past 15 years, Apple has collected a tax in the form of a 30% commission on the price of any app downloaded from the App Store, as well as on in-app purchases. Apple is able to command these fees from companies of all sizes. Apple has also suppressed the emergence of programs like cloud streaming apps, including gaming apps, as well as super apps that could reduce user dependence on Apple's own operating system and expensive hardware. And as any iPhone user who has ever seen a green text message or received a tiny grainy video can attest, Apple's anti-competitive conduct also includes making it more difficult for iPhone users to message with users of non-Apple products. It I'm gonna be real with you, I've had 
I've had friends who have Apple phones that tried to send me video and next thing you know, it's small, tiny and grainy. And I'm just like, why can't I see this? And all because they have an Apple phone and I have an Android. But let a friend that has an Android send me a video. It's perfect. Lou says, as an Apple user, this is absolutely true. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Grant says, let's not forget how the U.S. is trying to stop Huawei phones from gaining foothold in the West. I used to have a Huawei way back in the day. I used to have one. But yeah, they don't like the Chinese have uh, probably better quality phones now. Does this by diminishing the functionality of its own messaging app and by diminishing the functionality of third party messaging apps. By doing so, Apple knowingly and deliberately degrades quality, privacy and security for its users. For example, if an iPhone user messages a non iPhone user in Apple messages, the text appears not only as a green bubble, but incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted. Videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. As a result, iPhone users perceive rival smartphones as being lower quality because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse, even though Apple is the one responsible for breaking cross-platform messaging. And by the way, how many times have people said that Apple is actually behind Android when it comes to innovation of their phones? Like there's a lot of people who have Androids that will, they will have things like a one, two, three years ahead of Apple. And then Apple will come out and say, oh, we have this feature and Android has been ha had that feature for like two, three years already. And it's like, Android uses like, where y'all, where y'all been? Goodness gracious. And it does so intentionally. For example, in 2013, a senior executive at Apple explained that supporting cross-platform messaging in Apple messages, quote, would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones, close quote. In 2022, Apple's CEO was asked whether Apple would fix iPhone to Android messaging. The questionnaire added, quote, not to make it personal, but I can't send my mom certain videos, close quote. Apple CEO responded, buy your mom an iPhone. In addition to selectively controlling app distribution and creation, we allege that Apple is violating the law by conditionally restricting developers access to the interface, which is needed to make an app functional on the Apple operating system. Let me ask you guys something here. For those of us who are a little bit older, let's go back, let's go back 20, 25 years. And let's say Apple makes a landline phone and they're doing the same things with the iPhone that they do with a landline phone. Like if, if I call my grandmother and she has a non-Apple phone, but I have an Apple landline phone and she has, let's say, a, a, a AT&T phone, right? And my phone calls don't go as clear as they should or they're not as high quality as they should. Would that be considered a problem? Of course, it would be considered a problem. Would it be justified that that comp that Apple is now being sued for making it so that their phones don't operate and interact with other phones as well? I would say that's fair. Most likely because if they're not 
operating as well, that means it's because they're choking the means of communication between from person to person. And so if you're choking the means of communication from person to person, even if it's text messages, you're making it so that it's just lower quality. And you're trying to force them to buy your product when in reality, if your product's better, then why are you sabotaging other people? Capitalism is the worst, man. For a product like a smartwatch or a digital wallet to be useful to an iPhone user, it must be able to communicate with the iPhone's operating system. But Apple creates barriers that make it extremely difficult and expensive for both users and developers to venture outside the Apple ecosystem. When it comes to smartwatches, Apple not only drives users to purchase an Apple Watch, which is only compatible with an iPhone, it also uses its technical and contractual controls to make it harder for someone with an iPhone to use a non-Apple smartwatch. And when it comes to digital wallets, Apple's exclusionary conduct goes a step further. Digital wallets allow users to store and use passes and credentials in a single app, including credit cards, personal identification, movie tickets, and car keys. Apple Wallet is Apple's proprietary digital wallet on the iPhone. Apple actively encourages banks, merchants, and other parties to participate in Apple Wallet, but it simultaneously exerts its monopoly power to block these same partners from developing alternative payment products and services for iPhone users. For example, Apple has blocked third-party developers from creating competing digital wallets on the iPhone that use what is known as tap-to-pay functionality. That is the function that makes a digital wallet, well, a wallet. Instead, Apple forces those who want to use the wallet function to share personal information with Apple, even if they would prefer to share that information solely with their bank, medical provider, or other trusted third party. When an iPhone user puts a credit or debit card in an Apple wallet, Apple inserts itself into the process that would otherwise occur directly between the user and the card issuer. Yeah, that's capitalism. This introduces an additional potential point of failure for the privacy and security of Apple users. And that is just one way in which Apple is willing to make the iPhone less secure and less private in order to maintain its monopoly power. The Supreme Court defines monopoly power as, quote, the power to control prices or exclude competition. As set out in our complaint, Apple has that power in the smartphone market. Now having monopoly does not itself violate the antitrust laws but it does when a firm acquires or maintains monopoly power, not because it has a superior product or superior business acumen, but by engaging in exclusionary conduct. As set out in our complaint, Apple has maintained its power, not because of its superiority, because of its unlawful exclusionary behavior. So this is basically how capitalism um, operates, is that it will create monopolies. It's not a innovation. It is really a stifling of competition in order for it to stay on top. Once it does that, then it will try to eke out the rest of the competition or make it so that it's much harder for people to interact with the other competition. And then you have no choice but to use their product or service. And then a lot of times what ends up happening is the quality of the product or service ends up diminishing, but you have no choice but to use them. 
Isn't that what happened with Amazon? Right? Walmart? Like, Walmart was everywhere. And now, look, now that Walmart is everywhere and that everybody uses Walmart, now Walmart puts you to work by checking out your own stuff. Walmart puts you to work by making sure that our federal dollars go to pay for their workers to have food stamps instead of them actually paying their workers a living wage. That's how these companies operate because they don't actually want to pay their employees. It's all exploitative. Monopolies like Apple's threaten the free and fair markets upon which our economy is based. They stifle innovation. They hurt producers and workers, and they increase costs for consumers. Merit, 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 merit. <laughs> Come on, bro. That's how capitalism operates. Like, it, it, it's, you know what's crazy? You got a lot of people like Merrick Garland that go, oh my gosh, yeah, this is horrible. This is this is how it shouldn't be. This is why we have these these uh, measurements in place because they shouldn't be doing this. But that's that's like that's like giving a kid that's like giving a baby food and not expecting it to poop. Like if you give it food, it's gonna poop. That's like. Not, that's like a male and female having relations, and then she gets pregnant, and then a baby comes out nine months later. It's like one plus one equals two. That's how capitalism operates, baby. What in the world? Uh, is, uh, I can't believe this is happening. You can't believe it's happening. What? Y'all. Is this our attorney general? Is this the guy that they that Biden wanted to make? Wait, no, no, not Biden. Is this the guy that that I think Obama wanted to make him a Supreme Court justice? Jeez, Louise. If left unchallenged. Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. But there's a law for that. The Justice Department will vigorously enforce antitrust law. Enforcing the law protects consumers from higher prices and fewer choices. That is the Justice Department's legal obligation. That is what the American people expect. That is what they deserve. I am grateful to the attorneys and staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Let me share this with y'all. Apple is just a horrible company, man. You can get your hands on the newest model with basically no new features except the one Apple was legally forced into. That's right, besides the USB-C port, the iPhone 15 seems to be yet another upgrade that barely changes anything. As soon as it was announced, people everywhere were once again underwhelmed, bored, and frustrated. And to understand what I mean here, I need to provide some context. You see, the iPhone, as we all know, has the largest market share across the world. In the USA, smartphones are released almost every year. But in the early days, every new iPhone used to be something special. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. A big upgrade from the previous ones, which used to be very innovative and exciting. But as time progressed, Apple switched their focus from innovation to simply sales. The new iPhone 15 is pretty much the same. 
Just like every other year, the iPhone 15 has another camera upgrade, a new dynamic island, previously exclusive to premium iPhone 14 models, and an OLED Super Retina screen, compatible with Dolby Vision content. That's it. But it's not really the phone Apple's betting on. They're far more focused on the iPhone 15 Pro Max. And the iPhone 15 Pro Max has one of the best cameras in Apple's history, with a periscope zoom lens that bumps the optical zoom from three times to five times. All for the extra price of a total of $1,200. But once you look past most of the noise, you'll quickly realize that once again, there's nothing really new. A better camera, sure, some cool extra add-ons, but nothing game-changing or meaningful. And yet, according to reports, more than 250 million iPhones haven't been upgraded in the last four years, which means more and more people are desperate to change their smartphones and switch to a newer experience. And Apple CEO Tim Cook believes that the iPhone 15 line will be that legendary series that will break Apple's sales record because of it. They come out with a new model every single time, and then that new model is nothing different than the old model. So how does capitalism breed innovation? I... Let's continue. When top-heavy companies like this hold so much influence over the US's economy, bad news drops can erase billions in value in mere minutes. And after the last couple of weeks, the economy still looks like a house of cards. I may just be overreacting. My life was stressful enough without financial volatility. And clearly you guys feel the same, which is why you've been flocking to a potential safe haven asset with the help of our sponsors at Masterworks. Over 800,000 people have joined the platform to get access to offerings featuring legendary artists like Picasso, Monet, and Banksy. While the median stock on the S&P 5 500 is returning just 5% this year, public auction info shows work similar to their new Basquiat offering, appreciated in value by over 22% from 2006 to 2022. So it's easy to see why offerings have sold out within minutes. And since so many of you guys have created accounts, the rest of you still have the chance to skip the waitlist and start your collection today. Just make sure you click the link in the description below. In fact, all the technology gurus are predicting that the iPhone 15 will be one of the most important iPhones in history. Even though when you actually look at it, the iPhone 15 isn't revolutionary or legendary. It's just really nothing. The look of the iPhone 15 is insanely similar to the iPhone 14. Apple stopped innovating a long time ago. And now they just think about all the new ways they can sell a bad product to the masses. Yet people buy them. Why is that? Well, of course, Apple has a reputation of being the most revolutionary tech company in the world, providing an unmatched experience. That's why an average American will spend a big chunk of with their paycheck on buying the latest iPhone while neglecting other areas of their life because they don't want to look different from the crowd and society. Fear of missing out is the number one focus factor in modern marketing, and Apple is best when it comes to installing FOMO in people. Their marketing advertisements and slogans all reflect a message to people that if you don't have the latest iPhone, you are a boomer who's not keeping up with the modern world. Seeing how fast technology and times are changing, everyone wants to keep up with all the latest technology and latest trends, but they fail to see that the iPhone they're investing their money in is the same as the one they already own. If you guys don't remember, um, was it Sunday evening? I was actually reading uh, Laziness Does Not Exist, right? And I was reading Chapter 7, and one of the things is talks about uh, shrugging off society's shoulds. And one of the things that a lot of people are talking about is talking about comparing your life to other people, right? And a lot of times outside of the compar comparison, comparison of your life to people on Instagram or Facebook or what have you, it's also when you're out in real life and you see somebody with the latest iPhone, like, oh my gosh, I got the newest iPhone. Does it really improve their lives? Has it really been a something that really like enriches their life by having the latest iPhone? No. But what does Apple do? They go, well, if you're if you don't have the latest iPhone, you're just gonna get left out. Left out of what though? Left out of what? 
bad iOS updates? Getting charged extra just because I have, I can say I have the Apple? Is that what it is? Like, come on now. Oh, jeez. Just because his name is a little bit different, and Tim Cook has dubbed it the best ever. People lose their critical thinking and buy them without hesitation. The only change we've seen in the iPhone 15 is the charging port, which is a USB-C type from now on. And this decision is not Apple's own thinking, but something they've been forced to do. You see, the EU has made its guidelines clear that they want Apple to use USB type charging from now on, otherwise Apple will be banned from the European Union, which Apple can't even think of in their wildest nightmares. Losing Europe will be the biggest loss for Apple, and that's why they're letting go of their maverick nature of looking different from everyone else, and switching to USB-C. But that's not all because the European Union is going to force some major decisions on smartphone companies in the future. In 2023, hang on, let me go back to this. So, basically, they're like, oh, well, we have this new charging, yeah, this new charging port. Even though it was forced on them, they're like, oh, we got this new charger. Are you kidding me right now? That's not innovation. You're just catching up with everybody else because we all have the same charger now. So you don't have to buy one charger different than another. I remember when I was working at the electronics department back in Sears, you know, a few years ago. And one of the things that we had was there were all these different types of chargers. There were, and then if you had an Apple phone, you could not use an Android charger. Though, with Androids, you can use a couple of different chargers for diff interchanging with different phones. Now, anybody that got an Android, as long as you got an Android, you got the right charger for your phone. It doesn't matter if it's a Motorola. It doesn't matter if it's a Samsung. It doesn't matter if, if it's a, oh, what's, a, what's another phone company name? Phone manufacturer. Um. Which is the HTC? I think it is. There, there are other ones, right? But if it's a if it's an Android, you have the right charger. It doesn't matter the brand of the phone. But if you had an Apple, oh no, you you need to find somebody else who had an iPhone if your battery was about to go dead. But now Europe is like, no, 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 no. You have to have all chargers need to be universal now. Because here's the thing. That's like, that's like whoop. you having a product and that's like having a phone with a phone jack and it's a different phone jack for your phone versus everybody else. It doesn't make sense, right? Or it's like having a plug that's, that's built a different way. Well, you guys got to install this different type of plug in your wallet in order to use our product. The hell? No, I want my two prongs, baby. That's it. That's all. You don't need to. All because they want to keep you within that ecosystem. It is crazy on its face. I'm not going to watch that entire video, but. It's wild. But let me ask you this. Is Apple, are they going to be affected negatively? Is it going to be a significant effect on them by being sued by the Justice Department? Something tells me no. Because they, it's Apple. Now, we always do this. Let's go to follow the money. Let's see who owns what. This is Apple. And you guys already know who owns 8.54% of Apple. At the top is Vanguard. Next, at 6.75% is BlackRock. Then Berkshire Hathaway. Then State Street. Then Geo. Then FMR. Look, 
is it any surprise of who owns the biggest shares in Apple? So, yeah. Apple's being sued, but I don't honestly think. I just, I just don't. While I am, while that's also, let me see. Computer's acting a little wonky today. I want to share with you guys. Sorry, guys. Internet went out. Gosh. So let me share with you guys the results of the poll. You know, I'm I'm of this opinion that what we need is a product that is modular where we can just repair pieces of it or replace it with pieces. And like, for instance, they said in that video of just having replaceable batteries, like we had that years ago. Like, ain't nothing changed. Like, why are we, why is that new and novel when we had it when we first started having smartphones? Like, like I can't p- replace the battery even in my phone. It's crazy. All right. All right. So. Let me enlarge this just so that, oop, come on, there we go. There we go. All right, so let me share the screen. All right. So out of 51 votes, do you think the lawsuit would affect Apple Apple significantly? 16% says yes, this will change Apple. No, 41% says no, this will not or barely change. And then 43% said not sure. I appreciate the honesty with everybody. I'm of the opinion, no, this will barely change. But I think that a lot of people are saying, oh, my God, I can't believe this is actually happening. And it's like, it's an election year. Of course, they're going to go after the big player during an election year to make it seem like, oh, my goodness. Well, my Justice Department went against Apple. Yeah, but you could have went after them last year. You could have went after them the year before. You could have went after them in 2020. You chose not to. Mm-mm-mm. Let me see. Let me. Roger, I'm going to go into the. Uh, I'm going to go into the DM and. Read what you said. Because I think this is also important. I'm going to count this as a channel on Rockfin. So I'm just going to read this. Roger says, I just had a brainstorm to make 
more worker co-ops besides government agency at every level of government that does for worker co-ops what a SBA, Small Business Administration, does for small businesses. How about combining minimum wage and worker co-ops that says the following, a right to a living wage mandating 15% of monthly minimum wage income working full time 52 weeks a year be enough to cover fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment using the most expensive jurisdiction in the state as the starting point to make sure that the mom and pop shops franchise owners and small and medium sized businesses don't get put out of business says the amendment will provide a tax subsidy to cover 85 to 100 percent of their labor costs which will increase as their business grows over time in addition the subsidy will also be provided to startup worker cooperatives the wage will automatically and dynamically go up once their fair market rent goes up statewide without government intervention needed this is not a new idea seen that we have real proof as this work is done with the formerly incarcerated where the government will give tax rebates to companies to hire formerly incarcerated individuals where the government will pay 80 percent of their paychecks and the company owner paying 20 percent difference uh he says let me go even further cooperatize the hospitals along with nursing homes mental institutions medical facilities clinics and dialysis centers since we still live in a segregated communities by default well then here's your black worker co-op hospitals no one to take care of like we will no one will take care of us like we will offering free training for not just doctors but nurses but x-ray techs nutritionists and other positions to work in these worker co-op hospitals well Well, I do agree that it might be better to have a worker co-op hospital, I'm still for it being like a nationalization. But, and you know, we, we can kind of have that debate, you know, one day. But yeah, so let me go to The Rock as well. And then we'll go to the rest of the chat. All right. Thank you for the tip on Rockman Roger. He says, you know, this guy was going to have something to say about what happened to Apple. Go to marker two minutes and 27 to the seventh minute. Don't forget to check DM. I just did. Okay. What's this? Uh oh. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> okay. All right. Let let let's go. Okay. All right. You you get you you got me. You got me. Okay. All right. Oh boy. So you said you said go to marker two two minute mark. Hang on. Two minutes and 20 seconds. All right, let's go. All right, two minutes and 20 seconds. All right. That time. Okay, let's go. Apple Computer was charged by the U.S. Department of the Treasury with functioning like a monopoly, trying to make sure it's the only one selling a variety of services and therefore charging more than they otherwise could if they didn't block the competition of competitors. I wanna talk about this, not so much about the particulars of this case, but more about the phenomena itself, so there's no misunderstanding. Virtually all capitalists dream of becoming monopolists. And the reason for that is very simple. If you're a capitalist among others, you're a competitor, you are limited in the price you can charge by the fact that your competitors producing more or less the same thing you do, if they don't raise their price and you do, your customers will go to them and you'll lose those customers. And that operates as a kind of discipline. You don't raise your price. 
But if you can shut competitors out, if you have none, well, then you don't suffer that problem. You can raise your price. Your customers may not buy, but they got no alternative. So many of them you expect and you find will, in fact, grin and bear it or not. Oh, baby. Yep. That's how capitalism works. Every capitalist, every capitalist wants to have a monopoly. Like, that's their goal. Their goal is to own it all by the end. Oh, thank you, Roger. Oh, thank you so much. All right, let's go back just a couple of seconds. Customers may not buy, but they got no alternative. So many of them you expect and you find will, in fact, grin and bear it or not grin, grit their teeth and pay the higher price. In short, a monopolist can raise prices higher than competitors normally can and thereby realize a bigger profit. And since profit is what the business is there to achieve, monopoly becomes an objective simply out of the logic of a profit-driven capitalism. Defenders of capitalism often try the following argument. If this happens, if company A, Apple, or anybody else gets a monopoly, and raises profits by raising its prices, well, that will become an incentive for other capitalists to want to get in on this business because look how much money the monopolist is making. The problem with this argument is that the people who have been most interested in it are the monopolists who understand exactly what threatens their monopoly is the arrival, the entry of others into that business. So they create barriers to entry. There's a whole literature in economics devoted to how and why and when monopolists erect barriers to entry. I'll give you a couple of examples. You do a heavy advertising for your project, for your product, you know, like say Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Millions of people make soda pop. But we buy those because we're constantly barred and no new entry can come in really easily and compete because they would have to have an advertising budget that they can't afford. That's a way of doing that. Claiming that your, your product has some magic ingredient that nobody else has is another way of trying to do that. In other words, monopolists know how to last for a long time. Then there's another argument. By the way, Back in the day, the magic ingredient in Coca-Cola was booger sugar, twinkle, twinkle, white girl. I can't say the actual word, but y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. So it was that <laughs> the stuff you put on your pinky. That was what was the magical stuff that used to be in Coca-Cola. Now it's just taste. Vibes, bro. <laughs> I've been hanging out with Rome too much. <laughs> Magic ingredient that nobody else has mm -hmm. is another way of trying to do that. Mm -hmm. In other words, monopolists know how to last for a long time. Then there's another argument says, well, yeah, but the Department of Justice Antitrust Division will find them out and prosecute them. Well, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But here's what we know and what we see. Monopolists tend to last a long time. A very small number of companies, technically called an oligopoly, if it's more than one, are very common in the United States, and they have been in the past, and here we are with Apple doing it again. Monopolies rip us off. They get more out of us than a competitive economic system would allow. And they do it all the time. And they do it for years before eventually they are faced with a new entry or an antitrust action. Like what's going on today, an antitrust action. And here's the thing. I do not trust 
that this action will actually produce anything worthwhile because all they got to do is pay off a politician and it goes away. Because you have capitalists or capitalist sympathizers in the Justice Department, in the White House, in the Senate, in the legislative branches, in the Supreme Court. Monopoly and its costs are a regular part of modern capitalism, and we are its victims. The Georgia legislature. All right. So thank you so very much for that, Roger. I love when Dr. Richard Wolf puts things into perspective like that. Let's continue. Roger, thank you so much for the tip. He says, I got news for you, James. Apple has always been a monopoly. This goes all the way back to the 80s since their inception. You see, when IBM tried to become propriety back then, the federal government came down on them because what happened was they were very expensive. And then you had all these proprietary companies that would make computer hardware and were incompatible with each other. So if you had a PC, even though it's not IBM, they call it IBM compatible because parts are interchangeable. I remember when people talked about IBM compatible. Oh my gosh. Okay. Some reason they didn't go, they didn't do the same with Apple, maybe because this suit will extend beyond phones, but their computers as well, thus making them all interchangeable with IBM compatible hardware as well. Just like what's going on in in Europe right now, where they want you to have USB-C uh, char charging cables, and you have to be able to have this charger on your phone, or else you cannot have the European market. So that's what's going on. So it's basically, instead of IBM compatible, now it's Android compatible. I see what you mean, Roger. I pick up what you're throwing down. Let's continue. This is making sense. Okay. He says as well, always remember this. When they say they let me say when they say, well, if you raise the minimum wage or you do this or that or some other capitalist BS argument, then make that then they'll cause inflation. You'll just tell them we have inflation because we have monopolies and oligopolies. Create more competition through trust busting and turn those pieces that were broken into worker cooperatives and inflation ends one and done. Thank you so very much for that, Roger. Appreciate it very much. I also have a couple things that I just wanted to look at this. Uh, Jacqueline says, one thing I had a thought of concerning JB's last story about Dollar General is how, how do we know that they aren't marking prices higher in black communities compared to white ones? That's a good question. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but you never know. Whatever man says, hot take. United States Department of Justice wants Apple to give them the security keys. I don't put it past them. Look at what they're trying to do with TikTok. You don't think that they don't want, the, especially the NSA, you don't think they don't want those back doors as well? Yeah, they want that too. Lou says, in tech, seemingly small changes can sometimes have a bigger impact than you would think. Okay. Terry says, these companies like BlackRock own the politicians. Absolutely. Mizu says, JB, if Apple wants to shut this up, shut this up, just finance enough for a decent open source operating system. Okay. I wish we had more open source. I think that will help us out. Notary S says worker co-ops are cool, but they provide no catalyst for systemic change. I understand um, what you what you're saying, uh, but if you make it normalized that workers are actually owning the means of production, then that actually makes it more easier to implement socialism. Because if they're used to it, they're going, "Oh, well, I already own the company." you know, as a worker owner, and we already 
democratically vote on how the company operates. So you mean you want to do this on a wide scale throughout the country? And then you get them used to it. That's that's how I go about it. Rondo says the engineers aren't thinking about disabled people when engineering new technologies. It's rather frustrating. Yeah, they never think about us. They don't care. This is why we need a new system. Rondo also puts this competition is a sin. John D. Rockefeller. He was a bastard. Mm -hmm. Let me see. <laughs> Thanks, Rondo. So uh, I think that's pretty much what I'm going to be ending with. Um, I mean, did you put something else in here? Oh, yeah. Okay, I got that. All right, just making make sure I'm okay. But yes, so when it comes to how uh, this system operates, a lot of times, you know, uh, people like Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice, they will sometimes do some somewhat positive things that make us go, oh, they're doing this. But in the end, I don't trust them to do what's, good for the people because it's it's like it's like putting um it's a facade right it's a facade to make us think that things are progressing when things aren't you know and you got to remember it's an election year people like joe biden are going to want something like this to happen to make it seem like that he's actually going after these companies it's just like, for instance, with, you know, oh, my God, the NLRB, it, you know, it, it's it's an election year. They really don't want to do anything productive in that way. They, it's just to make you think that. I don't know. That's just how it goes. And I think one of the best ways to be able to combat this is to and, and it was like uh, what uh, Ajima Baraka said yesterday on RBN is to start building dual powers so that we can make it so that we don't have to deal with these corporations. We can build a, a governmental structure alongside the United States governmental structure. The only difference is the one that we build will actually improve our material conditions and not keep us at this level that we are. So. So yes, but besides that, I'm going to be heading on out. Uh, look, if you guys would like to, uh, you guys can tune in whenever I do the readings for my books. Uh, Laziness Does Not Exist. I will continue that reading uh, of Water in the Spirit by Melodoma Patrice Somme. And then um, The Will to Change by Bell Hooks. I will also continue the reading of that later this week. So if you guys would like to, you guys can tune in to that as well. So thank you so very much to everybody for tuning in. It's been a long day for me, so I got to get going. Plus, I need to eat. I'm hungry. I had a salad, but that salad didn't really hit. I think I know exactly what I'm, what I'm going to have. Anywho, take care, everybody. Look, like I always say, water your plants, water yourselves. Leave the world better than you found them. Smoke them if you got them. <laughs> Drink them if you got them. If you ain't got them, then watch something funny because joy is revolutionary or read something because reading is fundamental. I love you guys for watching. Thank you so much to everybody for all your help and assistance. And wait, I think I have, I think I have a guest next week. Hang on. I know I have a guest coming on next week. Who do I have coming on next week? I forget. I got I to gotta put stuff in my calendar because I don't remember. Uh, let me see. I want to say, but I don't want to say because 
they we have it set for next week for now i just don't know if it's going to change but this person you guys know and she's great and then the week after that i have another guest coming on and she's great too oh i can't wait okay it's gonna be good but you guys will know by Sunday evening once I create the stream and everything. Just, just, just come on back. All right. Everybody, take care. Have a good one. And, uh, yeah, stay fresh and stay dangerous. Mwah! Forehead kisses to every single one of you because you guys are amazing and I appreciate you. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further, so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.